Jet Ski Experience. This is going to be episode 195, and it's titled Water Samurai Illustration because I want to, uh, in the previous previous episode, I was talking about um, how I had an idea for merch, and I'm just going to go ahead and start working on it. Um, I think it'll probably be like, I'll just work on it for now thing and then jump back onto my series and then next week I'll, you know, continue it a little bit more. Th I mean, I don't know how I'm going to do these things. None of this is really all too planned out. Maybe, uh, that's on me and that's my problem maybe. But either way, um, I just, uh. Yeah, yeah, I, I just felt like doing it. I had the idea. I did a, a bit of research, and I said, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do it. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> so, so here we are. Um, and yeah, man, today's today's date is Saturday. What is it? July 10th of this live live recording. So if you're catching me on YouTube uh, and you want to catch me live rather than these backlogged episodes, uh, you can catch me on Twitch, Draw on Twitch. And if you don't want to have a Twitch, uh, whatever, let me sip this coffee. If you don't want to have a, uh, a Twitch thing, you could also watch these things on my Patreon. Pretty much uh, as I finish them on Twitch, they go up on Patreon and you can watch them there. Um, you know, patrons start at a dollar just for regular support, but or a dollar a month at regular support, or um, you know, I offer commissions starting at three dollars a month, and then it goes all the way up, up and up uh, throughout the tiers. And you know, you can check those out there. Uh, a bunch of dope stuff, and which is interesting because what I'm going to be working on today. Since it's going for clothing merch, let me scroll back. Uh, some of you might recall this one from a while back. I'll be working on a piece that's this size. And, uh, you know, and this one ended up on a t-shirt. I digitally colored it and everything like that. And what else? What else was there? Man, I'm, I'm kind of one-handed since I have uh, my, my coffee in the other hand limited mobility see like this is another one that I threw up onto some merch so you can see the size that I'm going to be working at today um, and yeah that's going to be exciting because talking about the Patreon and the commissions that you get with that you know you get much larger commissions I'll work on um, not in my sketchbook necessarily, but if you, you know, depending on the tier, if you want to have the actual original work, I can uh, ship that out to you and that'll be done on like a better paper and everything like that. And I can actually do my watercolors and all that stuff. So that's super cool. But either way, uh, you know, that's if you uh, don't want to subscribe on Twitch. But if you do, please, please do. <laughs> And other than that, man, G Mr. Drew on all the other social medias, Instagram, Twitter, all that stuff, man. You can catch me there doing all that stuff. So either way, uh, let's get into this. Um, I have, what do I have going on right now? I just went to Future Sound Productions uh, playlist, and he has a whole series on Metal Gear 2. And I don't know anything about these videos. I just know I love his, his videos. So I'm just going to have those playing in the background while I do this. Um, I do have a small sketch. Let's see if I, I can get that on camera here. So you can see I did a really small thumbnail and this is basically what I'm going to be drawing on this page over here, uh, rather large, like in those previous drawings that you saw. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to start working on it. And like I said, I probably only got like an hour, maybe 90 minutes to, to work on this right now. So. I'll probably just like get like the pencil sketch done. I, I'd be surprised if I get into any shading. But either way, one-handed. Let's do this. Adjust this camera. Bring this down. And let's see. Where's Here's kind of the top of the page, so it's a little off camera. 
bottom page, a little off camera, so the camera's kind of centered on it. Cool. References, make sure I get this hill started correctly. Is doing away with special purpose hardware and integrating all the components of digital multimedia processing onto a single integrated circuit dock. One built to accommodate massive amounts of rapid data exchange between them. Because the instruction code with multimedia dynamic machines, like with PlayStation, remain simple and unchanging, they can process tons more data faster than a standard 90 there PC by way of loops and repetitive process cycles. But because they're also built with more bandwidth, this processing can happen along much wider lanes, too. What remained classified by Sony until a leak in 97 brought it partially to light is that the PS2 will use a revolutionary, dynamic, single-die design capable of rendering a whopping 75 million polygons per second. EE, or a motion engine, a fusion between a CPU and a digital signal processor. Developed by Toshiba, the EE will be put together not unlike a development team, who, by working collectively to become more than the sum of their parts, embody the slogan of the American Revolution, E Pluribus Unum, out of many, one. But Kojima's team won't get a first-hand look at a PS2 evaluation use graphic board for almost two months. So to start off, the director focuses first on the question of story and theme. One draws heavily from the conflict that gave birth to real-time 3D, the Iraq War. And now, it seems a second major Iraq conflict is imminent, a sequel war, the perfect topic for a sequel war game. Kojima's first spark of inspiration for what will become MPS2 comes from the controversial Gunscom inspection incident. As one of the team will detail in a book years and years from now named Iraq Confidential, the UNSCOM, or United Nations Special Commission, is supposed to be an international neutral task force with the objective of certifying that Saddam Hussein, Iraq's dictator, has honored the terms of the ceasefire and completely disarmed Iraq of all WMD nuclear, chemical, and biological. Instead, allegedly, Unscum served as a cover mm -hmm. for American intelligence operations in Iraq and the CIA's true objective of so-called regime change. When back on August 5th, Iraq had halted all cooperation, the U.S. responded by pushing tensions to the brink of war. And six days after MGF-1's release, the U.N. Security Council passed it on September 9th, 1998. Resolution 1194, an official condemnation of Iraq. 1998 is a particular 
particularly momentous here in the decade-long Pax Americana. Only two days after Iraq's suspension of compliance, American embassies in Nairobi, Kenya, are bombed. The Washington Post reports that while no previously known terrorist organization claims responsibility, suspicion has fallen on an Egyptian wing of the so-called Islamic Jihad group, and with them, quote, a wealthy Saudi exile, Osama bin Laden. Meanwhile, back in April, the Jerusalem Post had reported that as the USSR was collapsing in late 1991, between two to four nuclear weapons were being purchased from Kazakhstan by none other than Iran. However, without the addition of former Soviet scientists, the Iranians reportedly lacked the know-how needed to bypass the weapons security system. With all of these scandals and rumors floating around, particularly the Monica Lewinsky incident, that for a moment nearly seemed to trigger war with Iraq and may have influenced the decision to retaliate against bin Laden by bombing a hospital in Sudan and a training camp in Afghanistan, Kojima, years ahead of former UNSCOM official Scott Ritter, makes a connection between this context of 1998 and a neo-noir film that had released in 1997, named not Iraq, but L.A. Confidential. It would provide the single largest cinematic inspiration for MGS2. Using it, Kojima comes up with a very rough sketch of the plot of the game. It goes something like this. Okay, so he's gripping it One year like after the this. Incident, revolver ocelot and the American president, secretly a third big boss, so, yeah, known as Solomon, um, have spread here. Here. data and mode discs around the and globe for a hefty profit. The fingers now, are here. here. Not only to the big five nuclear powers, but to even small scale states like Iraq and North Korea. However, this is only a ruse. Left out of the data that's proliferated is the fact that Metal Gear Rex was never completed. Its power is purely theoretical, its proliferation purely an act of terrorism. To advance a secret plan known as the Arsenal Metal Gear Project, a concealed Metal Gear wearing the outward form of an aircraft carrier. But when this aircraft carrier gets hijacked by a liquid snake and the revivified sons of Big Boss, right in the middle of nuclear inspections over in Iraq and Iran, Solid Snake must defeat the terrorists and disarm the weapon before the incident triggers a third world war. The game, Kojima envisions, will take place all within a single environment, just like MGS-1, except this time, instead of an island, it will be an aircraft carrier. September 29th, Kojima workshops aspects of the premise with KCE Japan's military advisor. By this point, the aircraft carrier becomes an oil tanker. And when he realizes the scenario is too short, Kojima looks for inspiration, not from a movie, but from a novel. It's called the New York Trilogy by Paul Auster. Genesis book 2 verses 1 through okay. 9. 
The entire human race forms together using a single language and sets out to build the tower to reach heaven and take the place of God. To prevent them from doing so, God scatters them over the face of the earth and, quote, confused the language of the whole world, end quote, splitting human speech into as many different language groups. Paul Oscar's first in the New York trilogy, City of Glass, concerns a father and son, both named Peter Stillman. Peter Sr. is a believer in the idea of a so-called prelapsarian, that is to say, an Edenic language, a pure tongue of God, where the words really are what they refer to. He comes to believe that the discovery of America opened the door to obtaining what had been lost in the fall out of heaven, so to speak. All right. is believed to have taken place in modern-day Iraq, and given the real motivation for conflict in the Gulf, Hell yeah. Gulf Preventing the so-called so far so good from becoming the Petro Euro, many connections can be drawn from the Tower of Babel to Y2K and to the seemingly imminent start of the Second Gulf War. By putting all these things together, by October 6, Kojima finalizes its planned direction for MGS2, which from here on out will also be known as the Hollywood Game. October 25th through 29, 1998. Now with its direction. Kojima, first alone, then with key members of the dev team, pull up in Nasu, a small Japanese tourist town, to conduct the so-called game plan camp. The team begins by thinking not only about their rivals now, but what they'll likely be doing with the next generation of hardware. The Hollywood game concept derives from the realization that few game series feature sequels in the conventional sense. All right. Move from one standalone story or episode so that's to pretty much that not a work on the face a little bit through a shared or similar game system or world KCE Japan resolved to use a hybrid fusion of the Hollywood and video game kind of sequel hence the phrase Hollywood game but how to go about this which involves enticing both series veterans and MGS2 entry rookies while motion capture experiments get underway to be teased in the expansion interval the team pondered this new form of theoretical digital fusion. How do all three stories in the New York trilogy fit together? Theme and setting. In GS2, he decides will be split into two pieces. One small, one big. Unified not only by story elements, but more importantly by theme and setting. Players who have beaten in GS1 can start off with the prologue, while Kojima plans for newcomers to be able to jump right in MGS2 won't be only one game, but two. It won't be MGS2, but also three. Each one will feel tailor-made for each player base, and both will transpire in the same location. One on a moving object there, the other a stationary one. That location is decided on November 4th as the New York Harbor in Lower Manhattan. While working on the MGS radio drama series with Casey Hebertan's sound director, Kazuki Maraoka, five days later, the two get to talking about MGS2 and sound. Without yet seeing the PS2 for a detailed study, they already know the console will feature DVD-quality digital sound. The idea of making the true Hollywood game means for both Kojima and Maraoka, true Hollywood sound. Who do they know from Hollywood with the right pedigree? Nobody. Dejectedly, or so the legend goes, the two directors decide to nerf their games by catching a movie. Back during work on MGS1, the team had found inspiration by watching movies like Predator and The Rock. Maybe this one, too, will again give them some clue as to how to move forward. Alright, finally finished my coffee. Let me get back to dual wielding. Oh, Alright. The movie is The Replacement Killers, a true 21st century globalization era action clip. Directed by a black American and led by a star of Hong Kong Kung Fu Cinema, the film's soundtrack blows Tsujima and Matsuhana away. Let me see. 
see something like this. And then like that. Okay. rhythmic and dramatic without being all that melodic. This, the pair realized, is exactly what MGS2 will need, given it will have to be scored in black box fashion, without being sure, in other words, of what action on screen is exactly occurring at any given time, or when it will need to change musically. The two directors decide to write the composer of the film a letter, and send it alongside a sort of mix CD compilation of the composer's work that they'd like him to build on for MGS2. That composer, who also works, ironically, on The Rock with Hans Zimmer, is Harry Gregson Williams. The first thing I knew about it is that I had, uh, uh, through the mail, I, I received a CD of uh, a lot of my pieces of music from a lot of Hollywood action films. Um, the Rock, uh, The Replacement Killers, uh, Armageddon, Enemy of the State. And someone had put together a lot of music of mine and put it on one CD and uh, sent it over to me um, and proposed that um, they would like the game to sound like and feel like a Hollywood action movie. And uh, to do that, they'd like a film composer to do the score for my video so too. So um, that way we'll get me working on it. And uh, as soon as I received that CD, um, I realized that I've never done a, a video game before when I'm doing it. And they seem like writing a piece of music. That's how it came to be November 12th, Kojima starts to conceptualize the development process for MGS2 along the lines of a computer network by drafting a kind of proof of concept, a so-called grand game plan, and making it available digitally to the entire staff. Everyone will be on the same page via the power begin preparations for such a design document now. The same day, ACE Japan create a secure research lab at their offices in the Ibisu Garden Palace Tower, which they name after the Fox P4 gene, which works as a transcriptional repressor that represses lung-specific expression. We might compare the way the GS2 functions to biologist Richard Dawkins' idea of the extended phenotype. Essentially, Dawkins thought the way biology up until then looked at how genes are expressed was like only focusing on, say, one component of a game console. In fact, Dawkins in his prime did not even see DNA as the end-all be-all means by which we pass on life or evolve. One of the single most important nonfiction texts for all of MGS has to be Dawkins' classic, The Selfish Gene. Dawkins thought one thing in particular about human beings could not be readily or completely explained by genetics alone. That one thing is culture. There is a wider story there, one that for Dawkins goes back further and deeper than DNA, goes back to the underlying purpose of DNA and of culture alike, namely the transmission and replication of information. Dawkins believed the human that innovated or evolved the next method for replication in the form of what he famously called memes. It would be the 
subjects of memes that MPS2 would center on, just as MPS1 had with memes. Clearly, Kojima and his writing team already had in mind Dawkins' memes, and the language repression idea that we'll find eventually in MGS2's nanomachine, which render the host unable to speak the word patriots, repressing them and transcripting them, so to speak, as the phrase la 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 la. This same repression of expression motif would heavily inform MGS2's marketing, which would lead many people to think that they'd be reprising their role for the entire game of Solid Snake. Even the opening pre-start menu trailer, so to speak, conveys these deceptions and lurking repressed truths. Directed by Kyle Cooper, who also worked on the iconic opening sequence for the movie Seven, we begin with hieroglyphics and Japanese calligraphy giving way to the Declaration of Independence, while Raiden, the secret new protagonist, shows his face only at the very last screen. That's right, with this they found their second major name from Hollywood movie making. Seven, like City of Glass from the New York trilogy and LA Confidential, was also an investigation thriller. Initially, Kojima toyed with calling this game MGS3, using Roman numerals. Although he only mentions in the grand game plan one meaning behind this, that they symbolize the three tallest skyscrapers in Manhattan, there may be at least a few more meanings worth delineating here. In inorganic chemistry, Roman numerals express the number of electrons lost through oxidation. A mnemonic is a tool that helps you remember an idea or phrase as a kind of code or a cipher. And one such mnemonic in chemistry is oil rig. Oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. This relates to the principle that electrons carry a negative charge. Of course, it also could imply a gap in the record, so to speak, a repressed break in the sequence. As Kojima's grand game plan conveys, his goal was to transfer over most of the underlying elements from MGS1 with the loss or okay. conversion of some of the characters, themes, and motifs from the original in order for the sequel to double as a standalone game to be enjoyed by newcomers and veterans alike. The function of calling it MGS3 effectively puts both veterans and newbies in the same confused boat. Scattered in their confusion, much like the human race after the Tower of Babel. In the design document, Kojima observes that most games become a successful series by standalone sequels, as we've discussed. MGS2 was envisioned as a kind of vision as a movie sequel and a game sequel. Another vision Kojima envisioned was between men and women players. MGS2 would feature more prominent women characters, not only in supporting but in main roles, to not only combine target demographics but showcase how, in Kojima's own words, the 21st century, the third century of the American Empire, would be the age of women. In the preliminary draft, grand game design document. Kojima writes that he envisions MGS2 as a series of spy versus spy and betrayers, a game iteration of LA Confidential, where not everything your eyes tell you is the truth. MGS2 will be a game where the player will come to question if what we call reality is even itself really the truth, a game laden with ironies aimed at the digital society and gaming culture. By this point, January 1999, the plot of the game has been fleshed out a lot more. Here's how Kojima outlines his ideas. Quote, Tanker Chapter, only available to players who have played in GS1. Having learned of the development of a prototype Metal Gear Interceptor, an amphibious Metal Gear, Snake, working for the anti-Metal Gear organization Philanthropy, infiltrates a large tanker traveling through New York Harbor, supported over the codec by Otacon, Snake, Dave, discovers a new type of Metal Gear, Metal Gear Ray, inside the ship. Also inside are several hundred U.S. Marines, as well as the Commandant of the Marine Corps, part of the sort of deployment supposedly there only to guard Ray. Avoiding the troops, who cannot use firearms, and knocking them out when necessary, Snake makes it to the Metal Gear. But then at that very moment, Ocelot and Erlukovich suddenly appear, seizing the prototype. After taking control of it, Ocelot kills the Commandant, crushes Rulukovich and his men, and fires a massive beam from his mouth, sinking the ship along with Snake. Ocelot then disappears in the okay. ocean. Approximately one year after the sinking of the tanker off the coast of Manhattan, an oil fence has been laid around the New York Harbor area in order to contain the crude oil leaked from the tanker. After the accident, a massive offshore decontamination facility, Big Blue Apple, is constructed at the site of the spill. The American airstrike on Iraq in retaliation for the country's refusal to agree to weapons inspection are scheduled to begin two days from now. 
it is on this day that the offshore decontamination facility is captured by a member of Dead Cell, a Navy SEAL's anti-terrorism training unit, after they occupied the plant under the guise of conducting a drill. They have also taken hostage the president as well as a VIP from an environmental group, both of whom were there inspecting the plant at the time. This is a critically important time for the president with the deadline for confirming the airstrikes fast approaching. The terrorists, having planted C4 explosives around the plant, order the surrounding area clear. Should the facility explode, it would turn the entire harbor into an inferno and render the city of New York uninhabitable for half a century. The last member of Foxtown, codenamed Ryden, a rookie, is ordered to infiltrate the plant. Although in actuality, Foxtown no longer exists. The original Metal Gear Solid had been set in Alaska as a subtle nod to the market undergirding American power, trolling. The game was drawing parallels between oil and nuclear power as two complementary forms of harnessing energy in a literal sense. But with MGS2, the focus transitioned somewhat from so-called hard power to soft, how the U.S. had maintained its global hegemony at the turn of the century via controlling information, not only in terms of fact versus fiction, but also in terms of norms. From the United Nations to the practices of environmentalism and philanthropy, MGS2 was a revolutionary portrayal of the concept of soft power in the games industry for the first time. MGS1 was to atom bomb, but MGS2 as the perfect sequel was to the second generation of nuclear weapons, a hydrogen bomb. In this respect, controlling the flow of information became a key concept. Some specifics about hydrogen bombs and their inner workings remain secret from the public even today. Yet, similar processes are necessary in nuclear fission-powered reactors. This brings up another key concept for MGS2, namely dual use, which roughly means technology and information that has simultaneous civilian and military applications. The plant chapter opens with information on the link between nuclear weapons and information technology showing how both were in fact products of the post-war age. Tell reporter Tim Rogers that his goal with MGS2 was to, quote, make a video game that told a story that could only be told in a video game, end quote. According to Rogers, Kojima's, quote, first and foremost goal was to, quote, use the medium which is inherently post-modern, end quote. In this respect, Kojima would take inspiration from a second literary work, Kangaroo Notebook by Kobo Abe. And like Paul Auster's The New York Trilogy, The Kangaroo Notebook is also a work of postmodern literature where appearances and common sense constantly conflict with reality. By this point, a number of characters are sketched as concept art who won't make it into the final game. And many of their names are allusions to The New York Trilogy by Paul Auster. Perhaps one of many possible explanations behind the Roman numeral three. There's Max, or Maxine Work, essentially a Western analog to replace Mei Ling. She would quote Shakespeare instead of Confucius, and she quote use tricks and traps with save data before getting revealed at the end as an AI construct. In City of Glass, an author named Daniel Quinn writes detective fiction from the perspective of a solid snake-like hero named Max Work. There's also the Doc in MGS2's grand game plan from January of 1999. Doc is short for Dr. William Wilson. He was intended to serve as an analog to MGS1's Hal Emmerich as the brilliant technician behind this game's Metal Gear arsenal. He too is described as an AI construct. William Wilson was Daniel Quinn's pen name in City of Glass. Meanwhile, the Colonel was only to resemble Campbell from MGS1. His name was going to be also described in the design document are Chinamen, who will be fused together with an early idea to become the fully realized character named Bam, and Old Boy, who will, years later, return to MGS properly as an aspect of the character Pokemon. Each of Oscar's three stories in the New York Trilogy are thematically interlinked, to leave a sort of tapestry. In general, all three are about the maddening pursuit of capital T truth, and how that power of Babel-like project inevitably gets drowned in a veritable sea of information. The more data there is for us to crunch and interpret, the harder it becomes to thin down context, to 
this brings up another crucial related idea to MGS2, the so-called frame problem of artificial intelligence. But we'll get to that later. The name Sons of Liberty derives from a real group of terrorists from the revolutionary era who destroyed British printing presses and persecuted citizens of the crown in the name of freedom, patriotism, and equality. leaps and bounds for the subject of artificial intelligence. During Desert Storm in 1991, DARPA, who played a prominent role in the story of MGS-1, put three decades worth of development into practice with a logistics AI program called the okay. Dynamic Analysis and Replanning Tool, DARP. DARP made DARPA a huge profit by reportedly saving the U.S. military millions of dollars by allowing for on-the-fly adaptation to changing conditions in a crisis environment. From this initial spark, a whole host of huge AI advancements quickly followed throughout the decade. In just 1993 alone, the MIT COG project started an audacious plan to build a humanoid robot by the year 1998. Meanwhile, Lotfi Zedek at UC Berkeley wrote a landmark paper called Fuzzy Logic, Neural Networks, and Soft Computing. It represents one of the earliest explorations into the subject we know of today as machine learning. By 1998, Tiger Electronics unveiled the first AI-based domestic robot called Furby, and the so-called inventor of the World Wide Web, Sir Timothy John Burns Lee, publishes a paper that will produce standards by which the entire internet will soon become data machine readable, paving the way for the algorithmically-based search engines and data platforms like YouTube and Google, which, by the way, was incorporated in 1998, that we use today. This subject of AI will be at the heart of MGS2. In fact, the original name for the big shell, Big Blue Apple, may in fact be a reference to the IBM computer that was the first to defeat a human grandmaster at chess in 1997, Deep Blue. Moreover, this would extend from the story and themes down even to the way that MGS2 will be designed. By the time KTE Japan will commit to the idea of utilizing bespoke facial expressions around the same year of 2000, Cynthia Breazel at MIT publishes a dissertation on sociable machines, which describes the theoretical basis for Kismet, a robot with a face that can register and express a mimicry, a meme of human emotions. But the concept of virtual reality will also come to the forefront for MGS2 as a metaphor for the so-called new world. The dynamically changing digital environment to be featured in the game allows situations with, quote, multiple conditioned ports that change what happens depending on the circumstance, end quote. Forty minutes in, kind of getting there. Kind of getting there. physicalist simulations, 
It's the difference between, say, movie making on a set and virtual reality. Casey Ejapan resolved to use this next gen technology to do more than okay. what's predictable instead of making heavy use of CG rendered graphics, as you might expect from a so called Hollywood game. They'll focus on expanding MGS1 mechanically to enhance not its visuals, but its entire pseudo world, its entire X factor, being the tension of self. But how do you accomplish this? Well, by advancing everything surrounding the visuals, from guard behavior to number of enemies to a naturalistic pseudo environment. The plan quickly snowballs into one of making a total stealth action simulation and the ultimate pseudo reality as the true Hollywood game. December 2nd, 1998, the four team make a presentation to Konami, petitioning the publisher for funding to conduct basic research into the PS2 system architecture. The very next day, KCE Japan begin to build the staff for MGS2. By the end, the number will balloon to over 80 different personnel. On December 10th, the team secure the continued expertise of Motosada Mori. His seminars on the fundamentals of special forces teamwork and counter-terrorist operations will prove deeply pivotal for Sons of Liberty. Completing a growing number of projects from MGS audio dramas to further localization efforts for MGS-1 to preliminary work on Zone of the Enders, the staff was given access to the grand game plan as it was being developed. On December 18, 1998, leaders of the upcoming project led a presentation within Konami's in-house death school. It was here the medium poly Mei Ling character model that we would see in MGS Integral was revealed for the first time. January 13th. Experiments in a tomb shading, not unlike 2002's Wind Waker, begin. This will soon be dropped, specifically on February 16th. But not before an attempt to bring Shinkawa's illustrations across in 3D in experiments that begin on January 25th. Three days later, the game plan becomes acceptable by the staff as HTML. It is now 12th of February, 1999. For the new protagonist, Bryden, the team decide on a kind of ossified, androgynous look. The mocap actor for Bryden will be told to move without gender, making it possible for a <laughs> Move without gender. <laughs> Do it. Here's how the dev team for MGS2 structured itself. At the top of the pyramid, so to speak, of course, is the director. Under him, the script unit, who designs maps and project details while making job orders to all the other sections. The script unit is also in charge of binding completed models, sounds, and programs with the in-house language, DCL, while making game adjustments. Under the script unit are the three different divisions, program, design, and sound. There's also an auxiliary unit tasked with developers Thanks to early research before development really commenced, the systems unit, a skeletal section that deals with 3D calculation, drawing, DVD access, script processing, and other processes, were able to make a maximum use of the PS2's power. The character unit, meanwhile, used medical references to study shoulder motion and muscles for facial expression. Most motions by the motion department, meanwhile, were not from motion capture. February 25th, Konami signed off on a higher budget estimate for the game's development. Two days prior to the European debut of MGS1, KCD Japan and the rest of the world officially learned of the PS2's specs. March 15th, Kojima begins a series of lengthy talks with songwriter Rika Muranaka about what will become MGS2's iconic Hollywood golden era style jazz big band finale. Can't say goodbye to yesterday. The stage unit visit a Japanese container ship in Kobe to conduct photo research. But with both the tune and the Shinkawa Touch art direction styles now rejected, the team have no idea what their game will wind up looking like. On April 2nd, they hold a meeting to evaluate MGS2's character direction. After a second discussion with Muranaka, on April 26, 1999, Kojima sends her conceptual lyrics for the theme she'll transform into the finished project. With the beginning of summer, it's clear that the situation in the Middle East is heating up too hotly for KCD Japan to remain comfortable with the wider context that they plan of an Iraqi or Iranian nuclear inspection. By May 
13, the team has begun a solution to the art direction question. The character models will themselves remain relatively low or medium quality. This will free up the remaining resources, which will go instead to things like facial expression and much more significantly, environments. But before full-scale development begins in earnest later this summer, Kojima and the team attend E3. While they're in Los Angeles, they visit Kyle Cooper and Gregson Williams in LA to touch base before flying for a momentous photo research shoot in Manhattan. It is here that they gain source reference material for a host of different objects in MGS2, taking pains to gain footage of the underside of the DW bridge to the NYPD's bomb disposal suit. Bombs, after all, from Bin Laden's to the Millennium Time Bomb are all the rage in 1998 and 99. Here's the footage the team shows Kyle Cooper to initiate his work on the MGS2 opening sequence. It's not much, but it seems designed just to give the Hollywood veteran a sense of what their game will look like. As they begin the hunt for a vocalist to perform Can't Say Goodbye to Yesterday, members of the team attend a lecture by Maury on SWAT and counter-terrorist tactics. These include team tactics, sniping, and most importantly of all, room clearing and hostage situations, and teamwork. And before the unveiling of MGS1 Interval, the research unit take a visit to the Museum of Ships. It's here they photograph not only a deep-sea diver suit, but a replica of the Universe Ireland, a ship built by the Gulf Oil Corporation in 1968. At the time, it was the largest ship in the world, a veritable Titanic. Its activation marked the opening of an offshore oil terminal outside Ireland, which was memorialized by the Clancy Brothers' song, Bringing Home the Oil. However, on the 24th of November, 1978, this became the site of a major tanker explosion, which caused two weeks of toxic and flammable gas-borne pollution. This would be known as the Beetlejuice incident, and it would directly be alluded to by the cover story offered by the Patriots in MGS2. Kojima envisioned MGS2's design as an extension of the hardware's dynamics. Not only would MGS2 improve the visuals of its predecessor, much more of a priority would be using, quote, the machine's advanced capabilities to expand the game's mechanics. We will use the PlayStation 2's capabilities to strengthen Metal Gear as a game. Instead of building up the visuals, we will build up its world. End quote. Oui. MGS2 would not focus on graphical fidelity discreetly, but on the wider simulation dynamics. For example, light and shadows were now part of the stealth gameplay. Enemy AI became more context-sensitive and unique. But many of the most important changes may revolutionize yeah. the entire 3D environment. The addition of first-person mode aim, for example, integrated high, middle, and low regions of the game world into a more pseudo-realistic continuum. Each user module program is written as a completed part, or actor, by the program unit, not to know who we are, and placed in-game by the script unit, led by Matsuhana and which will increase development efficiency compared to MGS1. But the same subcomponent-based efficiency can be observed in MGS2's memory map. Of the 32 megabytes of available access memory offered by the EE, 4 megabytes each is afforded to the program domain and digital memory access data workers for image drawing. Another twin set of allocations, this time only 512 kilobytes apiece, is apportioned to miscellaneous data and streaming work. Streaming is how the original Metal Gear Solid handled comprehensive use of voice acting across such lengthy cinematic cutscenes. Utilizing the principle of real-time operation, streaming in MGS1 and 2 embodies the distinction between dynamic and static multimedia devices and software, which we've discussed. The data from the CD or DVD is read and played in small amounts via repeated loops, which enables a large amount of multimedia data to be generated. In MGS2, two simultaneous streams can be played independently, allowing the important feature of emergent enemy radio dispatches, as well as the cute Easter egg that lets you respond to codec calls either positively or negatively with the L or R button sets respectively inside the protagonist's box. All the sound-related processing is handled by the I.O. processor, which generates data in response to the call and command of the EE. The remaining free space afforded by the EE's memory in MGS2 is split not unlike the tanker and plant chapters between one small and one big allocation, while seven megabytes go to permanent data, which includes, quote, data of things used in multiple stages like player and weapon data, end quote, 15 
15 megabytes go to the state-specific work area. One example of something KCE Japan made from scratch is MDS2's bespoke image drawing system, which works selectively by having each individual program only necessary to review a given object's display position and vertex information. This not only stays true to the fundamentals underneath the image drawing system used by MGS1, it helps to increase overall performance. This same Spartan efficiency and use of dynamic collective processes, so characteristic of its age, would also inform how MGS2 uses its video, RAM, and texture cache, which will be utilized as temporary storage for, quote, post effects, as well as to make efficient use of the limited VRAM, end quote. Textures, meanwhile, are made into transferable Lego block-esque data units, which will only be necessary to transfer relative to the given object image drawing at a given time. This means not all the models that you see on screen are drawn there simultaneously. Texture transferring occurs at a, quote, average of 2 to 3 megabytes per frame, end quote. Using this piecemeal method allows to read onto the memory a maximum of 10 megabytes of textures per stage. But during the development cycle for MGS1, the team had run into a lot of trouble at the end getting everything to fit. They even had to, according to the main programmer, Kazunobu Uihara, research some compression algorithms to get everything into the PlayStation's memory. Most of the CPU management is used to handle the graphics with MGS1. Enemy AI only takes up about 1-2% to of the CPU. End quote. Collision-related processes, meanwhile, roughly took up 2 to 3 percent. MGS2 is intended to be something of the opposite. A graphically low-intensity game with more resources going to calculations. KCE Japan holds a technical meeting with Sony about the PS2. Sony doesn't like for programmers to access the hardware directly, providing, typically, software libraries at a higher level of the architecture to make development easier and more and friendly. Since MGS1, however, KCE Japan prefer to do things their own way, the hard way, even the wrong way, using only the lowest level libraries as close to the hardware itself as possible to build out from them their own software libraries themselves. They'll do this again in MGS2 by innovating a number of closed system tools like the aforementioned DCL language and CPS server. June 30th, Work is finished on a Ryzen model with new joints, allowing for more complex dynamics and motion in cutscenes and in gameplay. Here it is. You see how when he breathes, different parts of his body move interdependently? Those are the joints. A major unexpected shift in MGS2's development comes on July 7th. It's the Japanese debut of a film called The Matrix. The film features many of the themes and ideas that Kojima has intended for MGS2's plant chapter. Fortunately, that's a while off from finalizing. On the 26th, the script mix for the tanker chapter is complete. Three days later, the team tries another technical experiment, this time one on the feasibility of facial animations in real time. August 6th, it's the anniversary of the Hiroshima bomb. It's been 54 years to the day. Kojima and his writing staff begin to workshop the plot of the plant chapter the very first time. August 20th to September 2nd, 1999. After a final talk, Muranaka finishes writing the end theme, and it gets recorded in the birthplace of both jazz and nuclear weapons, New York. The next day, the team reviews its work on MGS2 thus far. Ten days after that, the PS2 is announced to the world on September 13th, 1999. On the 26th, the research unit visits the Atsugi Aviation Show, where they'll gain important source images, courtesy of the JSDF, for aerial vehicles not unlike the Sikorsky MH-60R Seahawk, made by the same weapons developer behind the Cypher UAV. After another eval session and the stateside release of MGS VR missions, on the 14th of October, the team holds what the documented MGS people later call their spiritual boost party. That same day, Kojima meets again with Rex and Williams to provide paragraphs of words which he'll use to create the score for Sons of Liberty in lieu of the traditional method using film stills. He'll also be shown an early sort of teaser for the game. Even though this is pre-rendered, it shows where the game's 
progress is at at this point of late 1999. Between the 19th and 25th of November, following a third evaluation of the project, the schedule is redrawn. For the rest of the year, throughout December and into January of 2000, the team will focus solely on a series of mocap sessions. These will make MGS2 more like a Hollywood game hybrid than arguably any game before. On February 12, 2000, a demo reel is assembled to show Konami. This happens on the 18th. The emphasis is on the new feature the team has implemented to streamline efficient use of polygons via level of detail relativity. It also shows off both the upcoming game's use of facial animations and breakable glass objects. And of course, the internal demo will reveal snippets from the ending theme sung by professional jazz chanteuse Carla White. It's here also that we get a very first glimpse at Olga. In this demo, MGS2 at parts looks almost like a late PS1 era Resident Evil game. The large number of enemy soldiers during alerts that we see here will be lowered to make them individually more threatening, while the camera angles will become less flat. Throughout the development of the game in this period, as another nod to the New York trilogy, which featured a unifying motif of notebooks, the entire team has to keep notebooks where they are required to write at least one design idea per day. Every night, directors Matsuhana and Kojima read over them, and if they find an idea they like, after running the idea by the program unit to ensure it'll work, they put it in the game. One of these notebook ideas that saved MGS2 from looking too much like a last-gen camera-style game is the feature of being able to look around corners to see better. Another example, maybe as a nod to 1997's Batman and Robin, is the freeze cooling spray for disarming terrorist bombs. Throughout the... All right. And I can't believe what time it is. Only an hour in, and this is where we're at. Like I said, I, I think I'm going to call this video at that. Uh, just as a reminder, I have this uh, thumbnail here that I've been kind of following, as well as my references and things like that. The only thing I'm wondering now is if um, I have some like some some swirls going on here, if I'm going to include those or not. Uh, but before I do that, I'll probably have to draw the pattern that I want in here first. Uh, so that's the thing that I'm contemplating. I kind of got a lot more done than I thought I would, even though it is a pencil sketch and that's what I was uh, uh, imagining I would be getting done. Um, yeah, uh, super badass, super, looks super dope, like, you know, these things, uh, I just get an idea, they pop in my head, and then uh, after a little, re you know, researching for like <laughs> a few minutes, and then uh, doing a quick thumbnail, like, I just kind of blast through these things, and uh, yeah, man, it, it's really neat to see it come together and be like, oh man, this is actually kind of dope. <laughs> Um, the only thing I could hope is that I could actually execute it. You know, we're off to a good start. Uh, I really love uh, the way the hilt came out, the foreshortening in the arm here as well as in here. Um, you know, foreshortening is always a, a difficult thing to try to achieve. And uh, so, yeah, to get that and then to get the, the flowiness of everything... That's why I was kind of working in on these shades, just so I could see where the big blocks of shading is going to be. And, uh, and and then, yeah, I just wanted to get the face. And that's more uh, for you guys, just because I know, like, I don't really need to see the face like that. The, the, the big thing I need to, needed to get was, like, the cropping of the hair around the face. Uh, but I know, like, people, you, you know, they, they, they like to see faces and things. They want to see where this picture is going, what it what it looks like and I love this smug look on this guy's face uh, it was kinda of what I was hoping for something a, a little more like less intense you know but definitely you can still see the intent uh, within this picture and and yeah man uh, I r really like this really dig this I hope you know anybody who's been following me you guys can see the difference between when I work on you know these little these little sketches here, just trying to get ideas out, even like these portraits here where I'm rendering them. And, you know, you can see like, like how all this comes together. You know, if you've been watching, you've seen it. 
but you can see the difference between when I work on something like those that are like sticky note size and then something a little bit bigger like this where it's like you know I can I can get all the details I can get all the all the sexiness in there really um, and it's not really just dealing with like getting concepts and looks and colors and and all that stuff those are just like me getting ideas out where this is uh, something like this is me more trying to execute the illustrative purpose behind my art and you know to actually make things look good and look dope and all that so you know um, and if you've been following me long enough you'll know that my entire intent is to create a manga and all that other thing so with that said you can see the difference between uh, working on something like a cover page and what kind of uh, love would go into that as opposed to um, working on something that's more like a panel within a comic, you know, and then what you what you can get um, in something like that. So yeah, uh, yeah, you know, off to a good start. I'm actually really happy with this. I'm glad I got the uh, uh, measuring the page out done before I started the stream. Um, so yeah. Uh, Let's hope uh, when I when I continue this piece that I can actually do it well. Uh, next time when I when I get in here, what I'm gonna want to do is work on the pattern over here on the uh, I don't know if it's a kimono or whatever you want to call it, but the the pattern that I want to draw in here. Uh, hopefully I can get that done uh, well and proper, and uh, and and yeah. Uh, still wondering if I'm gonna want to draw the swirls in here or if I'm gonna add those in digitally later uh, giving this a, an entirely different kind of look which is may end up being what I want to do uh, now that I think about it uh, with the inspiration and the source that I'm pulling from in order to pull this together I'm not naming it yet it's probably obvious already uh, to some of you but um, artistically what I'm pulling from it did um, uh, integrate two separate styles into one, where one was a a more drawn look, and then the other one was more of an uh, an effects look. And combining those two things, you know, sometimes they can look alien unless you do it well and and try to you know bring an artistic integrity to it. Then it, it'll look it'll it'll look proper. It'll it'll look dope. And uh, the, the source that I'm pulling from definitely did it dope, and now that I'm thinking about it, it'll be easier for me, 100%, to draw the pattern on here and not have to draw all the, all the effects and everything else that I want to draw over on top of that. That might be something I want to do digitally later, and, uh, and, and yeah, the, you know, and it'll match even the source a little bit better. Uh, so... So yeah, man, this is uh, super cool. So I hope uh, hope you guys can see. Hope you guys can uh, appreciate. You know, I, I know it's a bummer that I don't finish these things right away. I'll probably be... I, I remember I spent about 13 hours on the other ones that I worked on at this size. So, you know, this being a one-hour drawing... Um, you know, who knows, there, there may be like 13 more episodes. I may do another hour and it may just cover me doing the, the pattern and then do another hour of me kind of doing more rendering and shading and then another hour where maybe I finally start to color. You, know, you, you see what I'm saying? But we'll, we'll be spending more time with this one. I just don't know if I'm going to be jumping on it directly tomorrow or if I'm going to continue my, uh, my sketching over here. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see. I, you know, it's it's whatever I feel like doing, I guess. And as always, I, I have plenty, I have plenty to work on. I still have a environment that I need to put together, which is what right here. Still working on these, where I still have to put an environment in this square. So you know, there is always plenty for me to to work on, depending on what it is that I, I feel like working on. Um, that's why I love this this series and this story that I've created because 
again, my goal was to do everything that I've ever wanted to do. And now that I, I took the five year break from doing art to write the story, uh, I have everything at my fingertips in order to create and, you know, to be putting all those things together, starting all the way from back at this map, you know, uh, the next, uh, the next environment that I need to work on is here. And then the next character, um, that I need to work on is, you know, or characters are probably going to be like either from over here or over here. Um, when I took those day, a few days off, when I, I said I was researching and I was doing research and things like that, it was for characters uh, over here in, in this part of the world, you know, like these uh, mermaid folks and things like that. So when I was doing research, I, I you know, I, I saw some really things that were really, really inspiring. I had a character that I've been struggling with for the past few years um, w with the ideas for him. And then the more I think about it, the more I, I, I liked it. And then I did a little bit of research and I was like, oh, yeah, that's definitely what I'm going to be doing. And uh makes me happy because, it, you know, childhood and things like that and ideas that I've had since then. Um, yeah, I wonder if uh, I'll, I'll be inspired by anything uh, to continue putting little little fan arts in in this page but yeah man you know oh always working on a bunch of stuff so damn that's a lot huh i have no idea what i want to do on this one or maybe i wanted to do a portrait of this guy over here and i'll, I'll revisit this guy a lot later because he he's like way late into the story he's on like the back end but I thought it was a good preview considering I was working on uh, on this thing here since I was working on this, you know. I was like, you know what, let me give these people a, a preview. But yeah. Um, yeah, I really love these. I, I really love where these are going. I get I get a little scared because I'm like, man, I'm really busting out a lot of ideas that I have and I'm wondering if I'm running through too many of my ideas on, you know, some back end characters. And by the time I get to other other places in the universe that I've created or other characters, if uh, I'm going to have to null and void some of these concepts and, you know, which will just be uh, hammering that steel, hammering those thoughts and, and really uh, bringing this world together. Um, but either way, I, I, I really love these. The, everything is coming along great, and I'm really happy I, I started this one. It's been a while since I did anything big, which is why I was kind of chomping at the bit to do some merch design. Uh, so yeah, hopefully something like this is super dope, and hopefully you guys are enjoying it. Like I said, man, I'm, uh... I'm G Mr. Drew, and that's at G Mr. Drew on all social media. You can follow, like, and subscribe. Uh, you know, I'm anywhere and everywhere. Links are in bio along with my website, gmrdrew.art. You can also, you know, links are everywhere and there. You can find merch stores, um, you know, ev everywhere on social media. You want to, you know, follow, like, and subscribe. That's, you know, any and all support is appreciated. And uh, uh, what else, man? <laughs> Again, if you're catching this on YouTube, uh, you can catch me live on Twitch, and if you don't want to have a Twitch um, account yourself, you know, you can catch these on Patreon. I usually upload them right away on Patreon, uh, and, you know, I imagine you can watch them there, and, you know, Patreon, everything starts at $1 just for regular support, and if you want commissions, they start at $3, and they go up from there, from tier to tier, and you can check those out. So if you like something like this and you want me to draw something like nice and big and pretty for you, you can check check out those tiers, man. I know like the top two tiers, especially the uh, 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 Kami, Kami level tier that I have and the uh, dragon level tier that I have, is, you know, they definitely get you something more along these lines, maybe even a few of them. I, I forget the details at this point, but it's all there on my Patreon. So it's G Mr. Drew everywhere. Check me out. Um, or don't, of course. <laughs> Have the freedom to choose whether or not you want to. 
But either way, uh, you've been watching the Andrew Glorzeski Experience. Love y'all. Peace.